I am very happy to welcome our own Jennifer Rittner. And uh, Jennifer has offered to introduce herself, so I'm just going to turn it over to her. Okay, fantastic. And thank you. I'm very delighted and as always honored to be here. Um, I'm going to do the the requisite, can everybody see my screen question? I'll assume yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so I just want to start off by acknowledging where we are um, and positioning us appropriately in the space. So I will actually read this. Um, so that you can you can follow along with me because it's right here. Uh, we begin by acknowledging that while we are all dispersed in our various homes, cities, and countries, SVA, the institution hosting our studies, sits on land historically stewarded by the Lenape people for thousands of years. New York City is still home to over 115,000 intertribal people who work and create culture on the island of Manhattan and beyond. Decolonization for indigenous people and communities is not a metaphor or an abstraction. It is about reclaiming a sovereignty against an oppressive government that negotiated in bad faith and has continued to break treaties that might otherwise have enabled tribal nations and native communities to build equities across this land. Um, the area that SVA sits on is also home to the Canarsie, Matinecock, Merrick and Rockaway. Many of these nations and nations across the country have languages that um, are endangered because of the forced movement and uh, expulsion of people from their own tribal homes uh, and the forced loss of their languages. And so there are many places in the United States where tribal people are looking to indigenous people, Native Americans, are reclaiming lost languages. And in addition, um, if you use the resource that I have made available here, you will see all of the treaties, many of which have been broken. And so I think it's useful to just understand, <clears throat> excuse me, that as we position ourselves in this conversation, we do so um, often uh, on the erasure and the negation of tribal people. Um, and we just need to be aware of that. So the so I'll say hi. This is me. Um, that's my mother and my my older brother, back in sometime around the 1970s when everything was super fashionable, as you can see. My mother came to this country from Brazil. She was probably we think about 19 when she came. She came by herself. She flew. She did not have to cross a land border, and uh, she came here because she was facing oppression in her own country and felt that she could find something better. But my history, as I have seen it through my mother, is that no matter where she has been, she has felt like an outsider. She felt like an outsider in her land. She felt like an outsider because of her race when she came to the United States. She felt like an outsider because of her uh, language. Um, and because of the lack of formal education that she received. And as a result, people have always pretended or seemed not to be able to understand her. And I think that in many ways that really colored my, uh, my desire to work in education, to think about the communicat communicative capacities of art where language often fails. Um, when I was young, uh, maybe about 14, oh, I must have been 14, so it was in 1983, I had the tremendous honor of interviewing Rosa Parks, who came to my junior high school um, to talk to our students. It was um, really just like one of the most special moments, and even then we knew how special it was to have Rosa Parks come. I also, at the same time, we had a couple from South Africa who came to our school. Uh, Mrs. Namso Stubbs and Reverend John Stubbs. They were a, they had to flee South Africa because of apartheid, which as many of you know, was a legal segregation in the country of South Africa, which was quite violent. And so they fled persecution, came to the United States and happened to settle near where I lived and went to school. And for a yearbook assignment, I was invited to go and interview them to hear about, to hear their story. Um, my mother is black and my father is white. And I'm sure somebody on the school yearbook committee said, oh, Jennifer should go and interview this couple. And as a result, I was very fortunate to hear their story. 
Um, again, I, I, I only share this to say that there was something in having the opportunity to see another family that was somewhat like my own that made me feel seen and represented in the world. And it was just incredibly special. And even though Rosa Parks was really the point of this assignment, it was the conversation I had with um, Mr. and Mrs. Stubbs in their tiny little attic apartment um, over a church that, that really resonated and stuck with me. And so hearing their stories uh, just, you know, has carried through my sense of what justice and equity can look like and what it looks like to live in persecution and in fear. And um, I don't know, feel dedicated to finding ways to share those stories. So uh, these are some of the places I've studied and worked. I was a student at NYU, went to Columbia for graduate school, worked at MoMA, the New York Historical Society, the American Federation of Arts. I was a museum educator for many years. Um, when I was in, when I went to NYU, I was at the Gallatin Division, which was the school for individualized studies, because like many Gallatin students, I had no idea what path I wanted to take. I just knew that all the majors available to me in the School of Art and Science didn't quite fit. And I just felt that there was something else. And Gallatin gave me an opportunity to make that something else possible. So I decided that my major would be art education and administration. And as a result, I was able to have several internships. Uh, one of them with this amazing woman, Claire Tankle, who at the time worked for the Bureau of Merit of, uh, oh my God, the, the Department of Cultural Affairs, which used to be in the building that is now the Museum of Art and Design, so many years ago. And through that internship, uh, Claire had been working with the American Indian Community House and what was then the Native American Heritage Council. And so this is a picture of us at the American Indian Community House uh, having a photo op for NYU for whatever reason, I think having to do with uh, an idea about representation in that document that they were creating. Um, it was actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Amer American Indian Community House in a bit, but just moving forward in time, I ended up at the American Federation of Arts, where I was hired as a minority hire for a project called Art Access To, and I uh, was the assistant curator of education for about two years. The head of education went on maternity leave, and I became the interim head of education, probably... In, I was in my like mid twenties at the time and just saw that as like an amazing opportunity to just make this thing my own and was there for maybe about four or five years writing um, education packets and organizing and leading consor consortium meetings with educators from museums around the country around a series of exhibitions that were specifically targeted to appeal to what was considered underserved audiences. And what was for me, I think the point that I was interested in making is that the underserved audience doesn't just mean black communities. It did mean that museums had to think about the specific communities that were not actually being served by the museum, but it wasn't just about marketing things to black audiences to come into the museum. It was about talking through what is the museum doing right now that is not serving their community? And so I think that we were starting to have just a different kind of conversation about the responsibility those museums had to their communities um, and to who they consider to be their intended audience, right? So to not tokenize black bodies in the museum, but to really shift the way they thought about the work they were doing. I did not, I'm not gonna say I was the most, like I didn't, can't say that everything I did was the success, but I think that, you know, in that time in the mid 90s, when we started talking about museum education as being sort of living in parallel with curatorship, right, and really changing the conversation about who is making meaning in the museum, it was really exciting to hear people talking about, uh, you know, reaching out in ways that had not happened before. Um, 
I had been at the AFA for several years, but did not have a graduate degree. And, you know, there's a real glass ceiling in the museum world. I did not have a master's and it meant that I just couldn't advance. Uh, and I just thought, you know, I didn't, I couldn't afford to go to grad school at the time. And I needed to make some kind of a, a move. And I decided there was just some interest I started to develop in this in design. So it's a kind of a shift that I made to leave museums for a time, move into the design space, and sort of it was an, it was sort of a circuitous logic there, but find my way eventually back to graduate school so that I would ultimately get back into museums. My career path has been a little bit, you know, a little bit dispersed, but it's all kind of worked out. So I'm glad that I've done all of these different pieces. Um, but after the AFA, I went to work at the AIGA. And then I went to graduate school at Columbia, worked at the Center for New Media Teaching and Learning on campus, spent some time there while I was getting my graduate degree, uh, then went to Pentagram where I worked for five years with Paula Scher on her team, not as a designer, but as a project manager at that time. While I was there, I started teaching at Parsons, was writing lesson plans for the New York Times Learning Network and starting to kind of like pull a lot of pieces together about design and education and writing and technology and kind of had moved away from museums, but museums were kind of always there in my, in my heart, obviously, but also just kind of in the back of my mind is just always kind of living there. Um, after I had been teaching at Parsons for a while and left the city, had my son, uh, was thinking about what I wanted to do, I got an invitation to come and teach at SVA. And I had met Alan Chachanov at a conference. I approached him and uh, he had been talking about the importance of design for social impact. And I confronted him by saying, I think it's great that you're talking about this, but it seems as though um, it kind of falls on deaf ears when you don't have any faculty who are people of color. And I would think that you should maybe consider having more people of color on your faculty. And he, I sent him a list of people who I thought should come and teach for him. And he asked if I would just come and do a, a short stint. And I've been there ever since and have brought other um, faculty of color into the department as well, which has really, I think, shifted some of the conversations that we can have there. So I teach in products of design. I teach a class in design history in the MA Design Research Writing and Criticism Program. Last year, uh, we launched, although I have to say it was not successfully launched because of COVID, but we created a program called the Colloquium for International Graduate Students, which was intended to help be, uh, sort of serve as a bridge for students coming to New York for the first time. and. Uh, sort of be learning about what some of the, the issues are that we are talking about in New York around race, around uh, equity, um, matters related to uh, sort of language difference and so on. And so we created this colloquium, again, to kind of serve as a bridge and a space of safety where students could come and talk about what it would be like to be in New York, to be in the United States in this particular moment without the, the sort of stresses of trying to do it within class, right? Or within the program to sort of a separate, a separate space. So hopefully that will happen at some point, uh, hopefully in the summer. In addition to my teaching, I have this strategy consulting business called Content Matters and do some speaking and writing around design and equity and uh, matters of uh, design education and equity. And I teach and I volunteer at the Montclair Art Museum, which is where I live and now where I live and the Van Vleck House and Gardens. Um, because I can't stop volunteering places. So that's, I get to enjoy a little bit of art and design in my, in my uh, own way. So, and then in addition to that, I have a couple of projects underway. I'm writing a book with some colleagues called uh, The Black Experience in Design, and I'm guest editing uh, an issue of Design Museum Foundation's magazine um, dedicated to design and policing. Okay. So that was a like resume stuff. Whew, that was a lot. Uh, so 
these three women have been really influential for me. Ray, Ray Alexander Minter on the left. It's a coincidence, by the way, that they all happen to be in kind of similar color scheme. Uh, walking stick in the center, and that's my mother on the right. Um, when I was in 1990, when I was still doing my internships, when I was at NYU, I went to this program at the New York Historical Society that was run by Dr. Alexander Minter, who at the time was the head of education. And the program was called Why History? Um, I don't remember what brought me there. I just remember that when I walked in, you know, the New York Historical Society, for those of you who have been in this building, in that building, it's a pretty old elite institution. It has a collection of uh, old master paintings, Hudson River paintings, Tiffany uh, uh, lamps, Audubon paintings. You know, it was not known as a very representative and inclusive space. And Dr. Ray Alexander Minter had organized this program for the institution to talk about how they were using their collection to have an honest conversation about our collective history and really raising within that space uh, the demand for the institution to interrogate the ways in which it was telling that story inequitably, dishonestly, and one-sidedly. And so she brought in a lot of people who were, did not have prior relationships with that museum uh, who are uh, artists and scholars and writers, um, people like Coco Fusco, who is a Cuban American artist, Cornel West, the African American philosopher, Diane Ravitch, an education scholar, people who were confronting the institution with the very mission that it was it had established, you know, a hundred years earlier. And as a result of that work, I'm not gonna say the institution changed overnight, but I think the fact that Dr. Alexander Minter stood on that stage to, to me, looking at her as a black woman who brought all of these black and brown voices into the conversation on the stage with her, um, it didn't even occur to me at the time that that was unusual. It just seemed like here was an institution that was open to interrogating itself and to confronting its own history. And it was just incredibly exciting to be there. And I knew that I wanted to go and work in that institution. And so I applied for an internship and Dr. Ray Alexander Minter hired me to be an intern there for a year. And it was really one of the most exciting times, um, you know, in, in my early career, pre-career is to be mentored by her. Um, I did not know at the time that she would be the only African-American woman I would meet during my career in museums. And she really was, up until that time, the only person who I met. But um, she still gave me this path, this window into what was possible. And again, to use her power and her voice to bring other voices into a conversation with that institution. So uh, when I worked with uh, her at that museum, and um, and I went back actually and worked at the New York Historical Society a few years later when it was a very different kind of museum when it actually closed its doors for a time and it was starting to deaccession its collections. It went through a very dark period, but uh, I still held out hope that the institution based on Dr. Minter's work could change. And it really has, you know, over the years, it did the work it interrogated itself, it brought new voices in, and it is a much more representative and inclusive place. Um, and that was, I think, based on Dr. Minter, again, being willing to stand up and have that argument, right? To see the power that she had to start to initiate that conversation and for that to be a collective conversation. Um, the second person who was really influential to me, whose work I met at the same time, but who I never met until just a couple of years ago, was the artist Kay Walking Stick. Um, she, this is a, a work of hers. She did a, a number of works. A lot of her work is based on this diptych, right? So playing with form and uh, scale and, um, well, for, we'll say just form and scale and texture. 
And so Dr. Oh, excuse me, Kay Walking Stick, who is a Cherokee American artist, her mother is of Scottish descent. Uh, her father is a member of the Cherokee Nation and Kay herself is a member of the Cherokee Nation. Um, there was something about Kay Walking Stick's conversation through her work about being biracial that spoke to me personally that in seeing her work and the exploration of self, of how one presents and performs and understands and interrogates how their identity exists within them, um, it was just something that I felt through her work that again, just spoke to me in a way that I had never experienced before with another artist. And I'm not Cherokee. Um, it, it had nothing to do with the, spe the specificity of her racial identity or ethnic identity. It was just the fact of this biracial person who was who was bringing these ideas onto the canvas um, and, and non uh, figuratively, but expressively inviting inviting me <laughs> into that conversation with her. Uh, and the idea that I had mentioned earlier of my mother and how she has never understood and, and the idea of how language was a divide, sort of a divide for her, I think Kay Walking Stick has played with this idea of visual language, the actual language of symbols and symbolism to speak where language cannot, um, but to also serve as a kind of an invitation to learn more uh, but also a way of saying not all things can be known, that some things are culturally specific, that not everything needs to be interpreted, that people have a right to own their own form of language. And so again, I think that Kay working in this diptych style and placing, as you see here, um, the symbols of the land on top of the land as a kind of... Um, protection as a form of protection on the land as a, as a as a form of saying there is while it may look empty it is not without culture and language and people and history um, and so that work really spoke to me so this is a little bit of a departure but all of this work kind of revolves to me around this question that saint augustine the algerian philosopher who wrote city of god uh, talked about in his work you know, a millennium ago, that it's the task of each to see that each is given what belongs to them. And that in our work as educators and, and, uh, and social beings and artists and designers and all of the ways in which we apply ourselves in, in social life is to understand not to give to each what we want but to understand the ways in which each person is coming with their own sets of needs and assumptions and desires. And can we hear them? Can we hear the thing that they are asking for? And I think that art is just this way in which we get to hear people say what is meaningful to them, uh, it, what, what makes meaning for them. So I'm not going to, this is not, I'm not going to do like my class lecture here. I'm going to focus on this middle part, which is that these three concepts kind of live together to me. But the important one here is the notion of a collective consciousness, that part of our social contract of being in community with one another is this fundamental belief that we share things in common and that our collective consciousness informs our sense of belonging and our identity and our behavior. And that through art, we can see those things made manifest. That art is the way in which we actually Im embody and manifest our collective consciousness as people. All right, that was part two. Now we're gonna get, this is the last part and then I'll stop talking. How are we doing so far? Should I keep going or should I pause? Good, okay. Okay, because I can only see like a few of you here. So, um, all right. So uh, when I think on some of the art influences that I've had, the, the, the objects of fine art that have connected to me other than the art of Kay Walking Stick, who I mentioned, is what I've always been drawn to are the ways in which stories that have been misrepresented in popular media, media can be beautifully represented 
by the hand of an artist who is reflecting on their own life. And so this work by Henry Oswe Tanner from the turn of the 20th century, from 1893, this quiet moment, which is one that I think would never have been accessible um, in, in sort of popular culture, the idea of a quietude, um, the, the, the intimacy of this moment, the lovingness and, and gentleness of this moment is something that was just missing from other forms of media representation that I saw. Uh, that this work by Aaron Douglas from the Harlem Renaissance in the early part of the 20th century, where Aaron Douglas was speaking joyfully about what African-American culture and life could be almost in this futuristic yet reaching back into an Africanness, into a history, right? A collective history to create something new that this work felt like an act of liberation and that when you encountered it, you couldn't not feel that from it, right? This joyful sense of liberation. Um, the work of Bill Trailer, who was um, born into slavery in Alabama and worked his entire life, lived his entire life after, after slavery ended as a sharecropper, um, who picked up any materials that he could find to represent the joyfulness in him, right? To create images that spoke to his sense of, of a creative life and a, and a joyful life. Um, the work of Jacob Lawrence, who spoke to and created works about what is a, 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 an act of tremendous trauma at that time, the Great Migration, which was African-Americans moving from the Southern part of the United States where they were facing terrorism by white residents and citizens against their bodies, right? Terrorism, um, economic terrorism, physical terrorism, and thousands of people tens of thousands, a hundred thousand people, hundreds of thousands of people left their homes in the south, moved by train, by foot up north to cities, Detroit, Chicago, New York, to make new lives. Um, that was traumatic. And yet when Jacob Lawrence created this series of works that was, and I forget the exact number of panels, forgive me because I, I, I just cannot remember and I should have written it down. Um, but he created this work that both spoke to the trauma um, and spoke just to the life, just to the experience and spoke to joy. Um, and he created this work importantly with tempera because the quickness of it, the spontaneity of it that he was capturing, right? Not to take the time, not. I mean, he took time, but not um, to labor over each panel, but this idea of just to capture this moment. I think um, this is just an incredible body of work. And I, I want to say MoMA has, is maybe showing it again. Am I right? Does anybody know? They are, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely worth seeing. Um, in the 1950s, the photographer and filmmaker Gordon Parks was making work that was reflecting on his life in Kansas. Um, again, you know, popular media representations of the time did not show the, the black family as being situated within the American dream in this way, the middle class. This was not something you were seeing just um, through your television screen or on film for the most part, mainstream America, right? And so this depiction is radical in its representation of the nuclear black family of the time, which spoke just volumes when you see it. You know, I was born in, I was born after this image was made, but going into museums and looking in art books and, and going into the, oh my gosh, I used to go into the stacks at Bope's library at NYU, just scour all of these books and just find, just like unearth things. And look, you know, I would find, I would find work that was um, traumatic to look at, but I would also find these very joyful images that were able to reflect what I understood about home life from my own home, from my neighbor's homes. And these were really deeply meaningful to engage with and to encounter. So, in um, 1989, sorry, I had to move my little chat window so I could look at the, the date there because I teach design history, but the dirty secret is I never remember dates and I have to write everything down 
Um, I was terrible in social studies class because I never remember dates and names. I still don't, dates and names. I don't know, but I remember stories, <laughs> but, but I have a trouble with the specifics. Um, a, a lawyer, academic activist by the name of Kimberly Crenshaw, who now runs what's called the African American Policy Forum. And if anybody's interested in this work in intersectionality, feminism, black feminism, uh, I highly recommend that you see what the African American Policy Forum is working on, and in particular, the podcast that she hosts called Intersectionality. But Kimberly Crenshaw wrote this journal article about demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex. Now, why is this important? At this moment, we hear a lot of people talking about intersectionality. And that term, which we're gonna talk about, which I'm gonna just sort of briefly describe or explain, um, has come to mean something kind of theoretical and abstract. It's bandied about quite a bit, but when Kimberly Crenshaw first developed this word, intersectionality, um, she was talking about something very specific, which is that women, black women were additionally disadvantaged by systems, specifically inter, um, economic systems, because of both race and gender. And the argument that she was making in this, in this document, and the reason I'm sharing this document is because again, the term intersectionality has come to kind of mean something broader, but it's really useful to see the origins, is she was looking at these three court cases one of which I will briefly explain was called DeGraff and Reed versus General Motors. See, I have to write it down because I forget names. Um, so in 1970, General Motors laid off workers because of an economic downturn. But because of the, um, because black women had only started being hired by General Motors in 1964, all of the black women who had been hired lost their jobs because they were the last hires and therefore were doubly disadvantaged by the layoffs because black men had worked at General Motors previously and white women had worked at General Motors previously. And so uh, the, the argument had been, well, women are not disadvantaged and blacks are not disadvantaged. So these black women are not being disadvantaged. And again, there was the specific way in which General Motors had hired people that meant that the black women who worked there were the first to be fired, to lose their jobs. So I, you have to sort of read the case, but the point that I'm making is that the idea of intersectionality was specifically about the way economic systems were additionally disadvantaging specific groups. Thank you, Aya, for adding that to the chat. And Mark as well, intersectionality um, is the term here. So a uh, work by Alan G. Johnson, Privilege, Power, and Difference, kind of gives you this, he creates this little graphic here that shows you all of the ways in which we understand identity to influence how we navigate the world and how we are, uh, how we are, um, how we are seen within systems, right? So what kind of privileges and power that we have because of these particular forms of identity. And I took that and complicated it um, because that is that is what I do. I have not come up with a better way of representing this, but I am really working on it. And one day I'm gonna get it right. But the thing that I was thinking about here was the ways in which actually we can understand identity and therefore to interrogate the intersections of our identities, the ways in which we are privileged or, or deprivileged um, powerful or powerless because of the ways in which our identity is fixed or changeable, right, mutable, um, the ways in which 
we represent ourselves or practice and performs versions of our identity and the ways in which we are seen because of other people's identity and assumptions about our identities. But my position here is that there are fixed ways, there are ways that are fluid, there are um, conditional and temporal forms of identity, and that we sort of have to understand the how we sort of move through these forms of identity to understand our power and privilege. All right, another big messy chart of mine. We're getting to the end here. All right, we're getting to art. We're moving sort of quickly through this and then getting back to art. Um, so I think the thing that the, the conversation that Mark and I have been having, and I guess the reason I'm sort of sitting here with you guys right now, is to think about how these questions are raised in the space of art making, art curation, the art economy, art writing, um, how people understand identity, behavior, and practices as a matter of equity. Um, so, you know, I had thought yesterday, Mark and I had, I think that was yesterday or two days ago, Mark and I had a chat about all the words, like the vocabulary of equity. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do like this big vocabulary list, right? I'm going to get all of my stuff from all of my different slides and have them all in one place. And here it is, boom. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Why? Why don't I want to do that? I, um, I think it's because the idea that there are clear definitions for all of these terms is maybe part of the fallacy and it's part of the work I'm thinking through, which is um, there are ways in which we are informed by our own identity and we understand this language of identity, the presentation of identity, the intersectionality of our identities, our performances of identity. Um, and I think that to understand those words is to unpack them together, not to simply get a definition from a person. I don't think there's one easy definition for really any of these terms. I mean, maybe a few, but not really. I think there are ways in which people are um, working through activism in the space of equity, Black Lives Matter, decolonization, tribal sovereignty, native futures, reparations. And I think we can again unpack those and talk about what each of those terms means, what it means to us and how we understand it in public discourse. We have this big messy box up here that's about all of the, the problem space the idea of a model minority, the fallacy of neutrality that says that we can somehow be objective, that in some way anyone could be objective um, when it comes to equity and equality and representation, the idea of the microaggression and the way in which people receive them, uh, receive slights, how to experience the microaggression is not to experience a moment in time, but to be weighted down with other people's assumptions of us and the ways in which people marginalize us unintentionally, often enough that it becomes this weight that we bear. Um, the outsider's gaze, the way in which we see others and objectify and subject others to interpretations of them without actually being a part of a conversation that they are having about themselves. Um, and then we have this question of practices. And I think that space of practices to me is almost the most problematic because it's the one in which we find hope and we say things will change. But I wonder if we really fully know the long-term impacts of some of these practices. And again, Mark and I sort of briefly talked about when we put things into practice, we say we are practicing them, but I wonder if we want to be more cautious in thinking through what is an attempt at a practice and when a practice is actually fully embedded into our systems where change is actually visible and we can look back in time and say, yes, now this has become a practice, right? So I think there's this temporal constraint to how we understand practices. So we can come back to this, this as the conversation that we might wanna have, um, but I really was struggling with how I did it, just didn't wanna like put definitions on those terms, but I wanted to pause on this question of equity scarcity. And I think that that whole big messy grid speaks to the anxiety and the tension of this moment, which is this notion that in order for one group to have equity, somehow others are therefore 
made to suffer. That if those who have been oppressed gain equity, um, zero sum gain. That if those who have been marginalized and oppressed uh, gain equity, somehow that would be a loss for those who have had power. And I think that the, the tension and anxiety of our time is that fundamental belief um, that to cede power to those who have been disenfranchised is to lose something fundamental as opposed to what the pedagogue Paulo Freire talked about in his work, which is that the oppressor who dehumanizes one is therefore dehumanized in that act. So equity scarcity speaks to the unwillingness of those in power to interrogate the power that they hold to actually bring others up into spaces of equity because of the fear of their own loss. All right, these are the last few slides that are now just art. Um, so the artists who are working today, whose work I, I just wanna bring into the space to say that I think they're just doing, um, they are, they are thinking about identity and representation. They're thinking about tradition and contemporary representation or contemporary reflections of, uh, and futuristic reflections of community. Um, so these are some of the artists who are really speaking to me right now. This woman, Terry Greaves is Kiowa. Uh, she does all of this work with traditional beading. So this is all hand beaded um, that she's done with Converse sneakers. And so asking the question of what is tradition uh, and how Native American work, Kiowa work in particular, can be both of the past and very much of the present. And like Kay Walking Sticks, she's using traditional symbology, Kiowa language on this work to speak within community not to the outsider, but to speak within community and to not explanatory comma, right? To not have to explain itself, but simply to be uh, and not to require interpretation. The artist, Willie Cole, who is uh, an SVA graduate, graduated from SVA in 1976. He is a Newark based artist who has been working with these irons and the iron for him has many, uh, this, this work actually, I think he does invite interpretation. So the iron has several meanings for him. One is that his mother was a domestic worker. And so the iron itself is a source of labor, the site of labor and bodily labor. Um, it is, it speaks to a kind of violence, uh, the, the, the scorch mark of the iron to have been burned by the iron. It is also, as you can see in this work, when he talks about man, spirit, and mask, the idea of a sort of reaching back into a Yoruba tradition and the masking of the face. And also, although he does not call this work, I almost want him to call this, but it would be too corny and I should never name artworks, but I always want him to call this Iron Man. But obviously these are, you know, ironing scorch marks here uh, in, the, in the creation of a body. Willie Cole, who again works out here in Newark, New Jersey, um, shows quite a lot locally, but um, yeah, I don't know what else I wanted to say about that. I had a thought, but I, I don't think it was a fully formed one. Um, the artist Layla Ali, who is from Buffalo, New York, has created the series of green heads. She's done quite a, a, many of these. I'm sure if any of you know her work, um, she does all of this work that she has talked about being racially or ethnically ambiguous. And so sort of like Kay Walking Stick, in a way, I think I've, this work resonates with me in how she is really playing with the idea of one's representation of identity or how one is known or seen. Um, the ambiguity that is also within these figures of anger or frustration or violence, the things that they are carrying, uh, the gestures and the postures of these characters that are, um, as you can see, I think, uh, what's, oh my God, I'm losing words. It might have to do with the fact that I've been talking for too long, but uh, yeah, I'll just go, I'll just go on. Once I lose words, I think they're just gone. So it's better that I just go. Uh, Lorna Simpson, who 
uh, has been doing quite a lot of work around hair. Uh, for those of you who know, she's also an SVA graduate. Have, have you seen Lorna Simpson's work? in your studies here. Yeah, you probably know Lorna Simpson. All right, so you know her work on hair. And here again, she's showing you the back of, not again, but she's showing you the back of her hair in these three different ways. One, as if to look through a mask. One is the um, hair weave, right? The idea of the, um, the hair as a form of mask and then her, the natural hair uh, coiffure. Theaster Gates, who, uh, for those of you who know his work, he is working in Chicago. Uh, he created these, so he bought this building for a dollar. I don't know how many of you know the story, but so Theaster bought this building for a dollar. It was a completely run down old savings and loan bank that had been servicing the community and had fallen into disarray in around the 1980s. And he decided that he wanted to re restore this space and turn it into an art space that he now calls the Stony Island Arts Bank. But in the process of renovating the space, he took some of the original tiles from the building. He turned them into bonds. He sold them for a thousand dollars a piece. Uh, and he ended up, and he, I think, I believe he sold about, let's see, a hundred of them. So the, the building itself in the form of the bonds paid for the restoration of the building. And as a result, when he reopened the building, it has become a very active community space that holds a collection of African-American publications, magazines, and uh, uh, original vinyl albums, and people can, and there are art exhibitions and so on there. And so Theaster is really thinking very much about the, the sightedness, the situatedness of the, the building itself, right, as a site of community, um, but the building itself funding itself. This artist uh, who is Co uh, Cochiti Pueblo, Virgil Ortiz, who is thinking and, and making and creating around the idea of native futures. Uh, and so creating a very sort of revolutionary art form that is about reclaiming the historical uh, narratives of the Pueblo. And in particular, he's talked about uh, the Pueblo revolution in the uh, uh, 1680, in which the, the Pueblo actually forcibly removed uh, British colonists, col colonialists, colonizers from their land in New Mexico, um, looking back into that time and asking what revolution will come next. And then we have a number of sites that are, you know, sort of design, technology, and art spaces. One of them is Afrotectopia, which was started by an artist, by uh, Ari Malenciano, who was an NYU graduate, started this as a graduate school project and is now I think in the third or fourth year of programming around a radical black futures. A new uh, um, uh, works a space for black filmmaking called Form No Form. And then I just happened to see this today. So I thought that I would bring it in with us. This, uh, this <laughs> work by Lorraine O'Grady from the 1980s in which she went to the African-American Day Parade in Harlem and framed people to say, this is what Harlem looks like. And this was used during Biden, uh, Joe Biden's presidential campaign uh, with Lorraine O'Grady's, as I understand it, permission. Uh, they reused this, this sort of performance art as a way of saying this is America. And so the African-American artist as the, again, like creating a vision for what is possible in our public discourse, right? And the visual language for that. All right, last thing that I will say to you is a story that I'm gonna tell you about um, an experience that I had with some students last year. So I brought my students, one class of students to the Metropolitan Museum. And we went to the Art of the Americas collection and beautiful collection. One of the things that we saw was this beautiful work, this gold ear flare, which is like an earring, but it's more like a, 
not a stud, there's another word for it, but it sticks, maybe a stud is the right word for it, but it's the kind that goes right through the ear and it's huge, right? The di diameter of like maybe a few inches. Um, and it sticks in the ear. And some of these have little pieces that jangle. So when you wear them, you don't only feel the weight and the texture of it, but you also hear the jangling in your ear. All of that is to say, this is really exceptional work of craftsmanship and art and design. And when we reflected on it afterward, the one of my students said, um, well, what that work showed me was how primitive people were in the Americas. And that was very much not the point that I was hoping students would walk away having learned. And it, it raised for me the question of, A, what did I do wrong there? Uh, because I always put it on myself first. Um, but B, how do I now start a different kind of conversation in which we can talk about how we come to other people's work how we can see other people's work without all of the baggage of, uh, um, how do I wanna say this? Uh, without all of the baggage of, of cultural representation of lesser and better, of high and low, of primitive and contemporary, right? The idea of, that I, that I think is really the problematic language here of a kind of cultural evolution. And I think that what this student was saying was that in his conception of culture, there is a before and then there is a better. And that this represents a primitiveness, a beforeness, a pre-culturalness, right? Um, that he could not understand within the context of that culture. So, um, so we do this all the time. We talk about subculture something being underneath or below. We talk about pre-cultural movements, right? Pre-modernism, as if anything that happened before modernism was somehow an earlier time in our evolution. And that was the conversation that I wanted us to be able to engage in about how we see each other without that baggage. Uh, and I don't know that I have a perfect answer for it, uh, but it's something that I'm continuing to think about. And that's essentially where my, my work is situated and how do we have that conversation? And with that, I am done talking and I'm, I'm open to having a conversation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Oh, so where should we, where should we begin with this conversation? Sometimes when you stop talking, it's like, whew. Aya, before we, mm -hmm. everyone came on, we were chatting a little bit about yeah. situatedness. Oh yeah, it was really interesting hearing your talk on so many levels too, is like, also as like a multiracial person, as like the daughter of an artist and a Yoruba priest, as like also as an educator. Um, you know, and I was also looking at that Lorna Simpson piece today. And when I saw the Joe Biden work, cause I'm also working on a lesson plan pulling from it. And it was, um, I think this kind of, I, it, when I was looking at that piece and also hearing about your work, and the work of the artists that you're looking at, it makes me think a lot about um, artists and their work in that situating within history. And it was really interesting also hearing about how the artists that you're looking at maybe also kind of like attempt to correct history or attempt to show like the true history that happened during yeah. times. Um, yeah. yeah. I think there is really uh, a, a concerted effort to reclaim historical narratives that were lost or erased or marginalized. Um, and that part of the work that we do need to do right now is to hold up those historical narratives that serve well to tell a more honest version of history, the things that have been left out and the things that were misrepresented. 
right? And Definitely. that is a work of intentional, intentional um, storytelling, not, oh, we, it happens when it happens, but to intentionally shift those narratives and bring in those stories. Definitely. And I think that, you know, I'm very much interested in, in I guess, non-mainstream histories that are true, you know, because a lot of times that we always take history as, and what is written in books and what we've read in there as the history, but really we're reading a very specific perspective okay. and, you know, usually by the person who comes out at the end as, you know, the quote unquote winner, especially if you're talking also about, you know, before also looking at the notes that Mark wrote about the zero sum game, you know, someone has to win, someone has to lose. Right. Right. If my history gets included, somehow your history gets diminished. Exactly. You know, one of the things that actually my graduate work, when I was at Columbia, my graduate work was looking at how we can uh, shift the way social studies is taught in high school. As I said, I was not a very good student of social studies because I can't remember dates and data points. This just doesn't happen for me. But I was really interested in the stories. And what I was working on in my graduate studies was how do we actually use art and artifacts as the jumping off point for learning about history? Because actually that is how history is learned. In other words, the idea mm -hmm. that we distill history down to the specific interpretations of information that's been passed down and passed down and passed down. Um, that is that is actually not how history is learned by historians. What they do is they go to sites, they look at artifacts, they look at art, they take cues, they learn about symbology, they talk to people, they get oral histories. This is how we learn history. And so I think that that idea of reclaiming narratives has to start with not just trying to rewrite history books, but actually radically changing the way we teach history fundamentally away from the written word, right? The things that we mm -hmm. learn because artifacts tell us how people actually live. And that visual thinking, that way of interpreting the object is a much more honest way to talk about history than for me to simply tell you, oh, this is what happened, right? And I think that when we look at the artifacts, we learn things that are much more fundamental to our being which is to say, we learn about families, we learn about women and labor, we learn about love, we learn about families, we learn about daily life. We don't just learn about wars and, and uh, you know, dis discovery. I hate that word. I always put it in quotes. Um, but the act of, of uh, cross-cultural contact, right, and therefore who wins. We, we, we stop talking just about winners. I'm not saying that that doesn't show up in art. It certainly does. But uh -huh. that art offers more complex representations of reality because that's what artists are doing. They are reflecting back what life is. And so, you know, I think that those reclaimed narratives are about getting away from the retellings and reinterpretations of historical moments and get us much more deeply into what life actually is like. Yeah, completely, right? It's like, isn't that what history is? It is, it's not, a. I mean, it is about the points in time and the people, but what makes it, I think, tangible is the narratives from it. I have a question. I guess it's an example that leads to a question, but um, I've been doing some research on the artist from the late 70s, Ramelzi, the New York um, graffiti writer, fine artist, hip hop MC, and so one of his, he, he's known as a Gothic futurist. That's what he wants to be called, is a Gothic mm. futurist. And one of his sources of inspiration is um, he's drawing from the practice of Middle Ages monks, um, creating complex letters that the priests and the lay people can't read, basically. And so what he does is he turns graffiti letters into these kind of like Gothic sculptures, basically. Um, and he also makes like these incredible assemblages out of garbage that, uh, reference excess and complexity of Gothic architecture. Um, and then in this documentary I was watching yesterday about him, he was referred to as an Afrofuturist. And mm -hmm. I guess like, he's drawing reference from European middle age culture and he wants to be known as a Gothic futurist. So my question is just like, why isn't he called that? And then like, am I approaching this as kind of like, post-racial naivete or 
like was his life and work kind of compartmentalized in a way that he didn't understand or like didn't intend, I guess. So he wants to be called a Gothic futurist. Yeah. And like, if you listen to him talk, he's always talking about like history in relation to his work and stuff like this. And I, I just like, I just had that thought, I guess. But Yeah. You know, I mean, my inclination is that people should be, should be um, referred to by whatever means they choose to be referred to. And if that is the language that he is using for his work, then why would it be called otherwise? And at the same time, I would make this counter argument, which is that the cultural critics, so of this time are also reflecting and kind of creating, um, I guess, a set of categories or descriptions or definitions for artists of other times that reflect an understanding that we have today. So can that artist be both? Can that artist be a Gothic futurist as that is the, the terminology, the language, the intention that they set? And also as we are understanding Afrofuturism today. So Yatasha Womack who started talking about Afrofuturism and I forget what a year she wrote her book Afrofuturism and I, it's in another room so I can't pick it up right now. But as we have, and you know, Sun Ra when was creating works of Afrofuturism, right? 40 years ago, uh, that the idea of Afrofuturism in the moment is encapsulating more people who might fall, sort of be included within that category. And I think that therefore you could, you have both, you can hold both labels, right? Understanding as Afrofuturist, self-proclaimed gothic futurist i don't know that one negates the other mm -hmm. i think it's interesting and i would like to see his work because i don't know this i don't know this artist's work we got oh, a God. we got a question in the chats it says in your studies do you consider the word as a component of the visual artwork if so what is your approach when there is a word contained in the visual artwork. Ah, so uh, just to be clear, I'm not a fine artist. Did we, I, I'm, okay, all right. Um, do I consider the word as a component of a visual artwork? I, I think that words are, are considered. Do you mean when a word, how, can you describe that? Could you explain that a, a little bit more? What you mean by the word? Yeah, it's about the language. Uh, when I was uh, seeing your examples with images and the power that they have to be larger than maybe the context of a culture, not universal, but collective, conscious, and so on, I was wondering what if, uh, what to think about artworks that has words in there. There are a lot of examples, um, but the word has more context, I think. The language, the way it is written. So I would love to hear from you. I know that you are a researcher and an educator, it's clear, but I would love to, because I've, I felt so, um, uh, contemplated when you talk up uh, when you to talk about this not uh, le let's give a chance to not try to understand uh, from our point of view uh, an ex an specific yeah. um, art artifact or an artwork or an expression from some for, from someone that is from a different culture and try to understand and contextualize better and I, talking about myself when i am in an international school when i am the only one that speak the language that i speak for example and i completely related with your mother history of course uh, um it's because you want to translate, you want to communicate, you want to, to talk 
the language that's shared, but you also want to uh, share your concepts that are a little bit different. And sometimes as an artist, for example, I feel a little bit in the between. I, I, I don't know very well how to position myself. And because your speech is so, um, uh, it seems, it sounds so, um, it makes so many sense for me. Uh, I would love to, to understand from you what you think about I, I put word, but we ha can have some uh, uh, symbols or some iconography from another culture. For me, it's magic. I love this kind of thing. Uh, but I would love to know from you this yeah. a little bit more what you are talking about this specificity yeah. and collectivity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I have a few responses. Let's see if I get close to um, something that means something. So today I teach a class in an undergraduate class in graphic design history. And so today we were talking very briefly about the futurists. And one of the works that we looked at was by Filippo Marinetti, whose work was essentially words um, in the futurist way sort of deconstructed and, uh, you know, sort of playing with the form and very lyrical. And I asked the students to please read the words. Uh, there was a lot of hesitation because the words were in Italian. And I said, does anybody happen to speak Italian in the group? And they said, no. And therefore it was very hard to get them to speak the words. And what I really wanted them to do was to play because the words are not just meaning, they're sound. And I wanted them to experience the sound. And I have no trouble being goofy in front of my students. So I made all the sounds, got and pew pew, and all the things, right? And all oh, there were laughter. Um, but the important thing was an explosione. And I don't speak Italian. I also don't speak Portuguese, by the way, even though my mother is Brazilian. That's a whole other story, uh, which actually is part of maybe the second part of this answer. Um, but that the words on the page were not just about the meaning, but very much about the embodiment of the sound. And I wanted them to experience that because the point of seeing it and experiencing the work was to feel those sounds. Um, the work was, and I'm forgetting the exact title, but the title itself is lyrical, about a woman reading a letter from her loved one at the front. And so the one tiny figure in silhouette is in a posture of this, of grief. And then around this figure, right, are all these sounds of explosions and sadness and, and again, like just chaos, right? So I think the words in that work, they, there were real words there as well that perhaps needed some context but the work itself lived beyond the words and that you could experience the meaning of the words and very much in the expressiveness in which it was presented in this work in which it is actually grafted onto this work. Um, you could learn the words, but it wouldn't give you access to the emotion unless you could actually embody the sounds, right? I think that, look, my mother, is from northeastern Brazil. So she actually used to say as a Bahian woman that no matter where else she went in Brazil, she was seen as, in her words, she would call herself a hillybill, which I understood meant it's like a hillbilly, like a kind of redneck. Um, no matter where she went, she always sounded a little bit not right to people, right? In, in, her, in her interpretation of their inter interpretation of her. So that words for her, language for her, was always an obstacle to being heard. And even if she said the words exactly right, it would always be interpreted as somehow less understandable because of the sounds that she would make in saying the word, right? So she is perceived as unintelligent because other people have decided not to hear her words. So. In that sense, language is an obstacle to meaning, right? So on, an, on a painting, in an artwork, in, a draw, in any right form of visual art, what does language do? I think that it is 
more than just words. It is the expressiveness that the artist is, is right, is, it is intending. And that uh, there's a whole other thought in my head and I don't even know if it really makes sense. But part of what I've been reflecting on is the way in which, you know, all language is coded and so how we code language in visual art to be, again, sort of to speak to those who are in the know, who are in the, the inner circle of knowing, right? That there is always a kind of inner circle that language speaks directly to. And that everyone on the outside of that is a little bit of a spectator looking in. And so again, I think language, language is an opportunity to be within the space, um, but also to define the boundaries of who is outside of it. And this is, you know, so because my mother is black and Brazilian and my dad is white and Jewish. So I don't really belong anywhere, but uh, there is something, and I grew up in a black redlined, a historically redlined community. We were born in Yonkers, New York. And so redlined means that the government actually established communities that were segregated by race specifically African-American, but um, you know, other minorities would also be sent into these redlined neighborhoods to, to live. And there's a whole long history of redlining that I will not explain here, but suffice to say that we, um, we lived in the historically redlined community of Yonkers and then in uh, the community where I grew up most of my life in another part of New York. So, I, uh, there was always for, for my brother and me, a little bit of an, uh, a little bit of an outsider status around vernacular forms of speech within our community that set us apart. So language again is, has always been something of an, uh, an, an entry point to a conversation and a distancing from the inner circle of right of community or of belonging. I don't know if that really answered, did that answer your question at all? Or did that touch on where you were going? It, 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 it answered for sure, because it's not a, a red race answer, right? It's an elaboration yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, I see what you wrote here. Translingual pedagogy aims to address the issues of equity in relation to how languages are spoken. Yeah, and how things are expressed in critique. That's <laughs> one of the challenges of critique is that it's using common language to describe something that exists beyond words, right? So when we try to describe a painting, we will always, or paint, I, I say painting as a shorthand for fine art and design as well. Um, in a way, it always kind of falls, falls short because how could words, fully encompass what is happening in, in any in any of these artistic mediums. Um, it somehow always feels a little bit incomplete. That, that makes me think about translation translation between like English and Spanish and how some thoughts or words in Spanish you can't translate it with in English and you can't really understand like the impact or the true meaning of it. So it's like problems with language, I don't know. Yeah. I was saying this to Aya earlier that I was, I, was, I was musing on the idea of tribal sovereignty and land sovereignty. And that in Brazil, uh, and you must know this as well, that the word for homeless is sem terra, without land. Am I right about that, right? It's without land. And that idea of to be Actual without- words. Two words, right? It's without yeah. land. Without land and without- a roof, a roof. And a without roof. a roof. roof. Yeah. yeah. Sem terra e sem teto. So, and in, in where, my, where my family still lives in Brazil, I have one a cousin who's an architect and he built a community for people who were without land and he found land for them to then have as their own, right? And so that idea of like landlessness I think in our conception of homelessness, it's not land, it's the structure 
on which land is. So Catalina, you're saying it's also without a roof, which by the way, they never told me, and I don't speak Portuguese fully. So it's like receiving this, this idea of landlessness felt so much more powerful to me than the way we describe homelessness to be without one's home structure. Yeah. So yeah, some things are not really fully translatable. Uh, is this a we question? Got another, yeah, we got another question in the chat. It oh, says, sure. I'm looking at the vocabulary of equity you put together. Thank you for that. As far as decolonization for the sake of social justice, how would an equal social contract look like? Are you of the idea that not everyone needs an explanation and maybe leave each community to create their own terms of living or something close to the concept of zero sum games. Yeah. So I think this is one of the reasons that it's so hard to define these terms, because in fact, I think what we all need to do in communities and in overlapping communities, so no one person gets to define these terms, but is to unpack them together. Because for, for for communities that are actually fighting for tribal sovereignty, decolonization is not um, is not abstract. It's very literally to be removed from the land, to own their land, to have those treaties honored, and to have some of the original treaties honored that have been broken and broken over and over again. So decolonization is very literal. The question of what an equal social contract looks like. Yeah, I think those are questions that have to be negotiated among people, and that's a very complex effort. I, the question of what it looks like in literal geographic communities, my God, what would that look like if we actually got to come to the table and talk about what social equity would look like for each of us? And you know, the work of truth and reconciliation is for each person to be able to come to a table, to a space, together as community, across interests, across experiences, and say, this is, this is, this is what I have done. Um, this is what life has meant for me. This is, these are the actions I have taken that have been oppressive or inequitable. Um, and therefore, by collectively understanding what each person's role has been, we can determine a path forward. Um, but it, what does that look like, for example, in, in the context of SVA, of, an, of any program, of an educational program? What does it look like in the context of a gentrified neighborhood? Where do you start when it comes to, you know, a part of Brooklyn that has been gentrified and, and people have already been displaced? Um, who gets to come back and be a part of that conversation? Who sets the terms of that conversation? You know, it's very hard to hear people. I, I find it more increasingly, increasingly hard to hear people. Um, so, um, my, yeah. my, sorry about that. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, do you think it's achievable? Not necessarily if, you know, if it's achievable to or, or can you achieve this a decolonized state for indigenous people? I have a real problem with um, tribal people as I think it's uh, kind of, it's a projection almost mm -hmm. onto indigenous people or um, different groups of people um, can be problematic. So do you think it is achievable? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, that, that correction on language. So um, tribal lands is, is often a term used by indigenous Native American people about the lands, but the people ourselves are not tribal. So yes, that's a, that's an important correction. So do I think it's achievable? You know, I don't know what's achievable. Do I think that it's worth the process? That I do. And I think that the process itself and the act of, of, have, of engaging those conversations that are leading toward change, toward action, to establish what action should look like so it's not just talk, empty into a vacuum, but that there is a structure for 
how the conversation leads to action and that there is an intention or set around that, I think that that process is deeply meaningful. Um, I don't know what's achievable because I don't know that we have yet done the work to even define the terms of the conversation. Um, those conversations are often intellectual and out of reach, but not real and based in community. And I think that a lot of the people who are doing the work, and I take that back actually, because I think that in fact, there are community based, there are community spaces that are doing this work, but the people who are coming to the table are often those of us who are marginalized. And so the people who need to come to the table are those who have power and are willing to then cede power, zero sum game, right? Cede power in order that some new can flourish. And what that new thing that might flourish, we haven't tried that yet. So how do you get the people who have power to come to the table and actually not just lip service, but actually engage meaningfully? You know, I think it needs to have, look, the reason I tell the story about the New York Historical Society, for better or worse, what that organization, what that institution did is it, it accepted the mandate to change. And while the institution is certainly not perfect, it has done the work to be more representative and inclusive. And, uh, and, and I think that that is the thing that our institutions have to be willing to do. Yeah, that's a good question, Mark, about do people feel excluded from the conversation? Um, I have a question. So you were saying that when someone gets represented, someone gets underrepresented. And you know, I was just wondering what you would like to see like in 30 years in the future, like with an institution, like who would get to choose who's represented and who do you think like, because representing everyone is almost impossible. So who do you think would be represented and who would you want to um, choose that is gonna yeah. be represented? Yeah. So I think the answer to that is not so much the who, but the how, which is to say that I think mechanisms need to be in place so that equity means that not one type of person is always in control, but that the, the, the mechanisms for representation allow that, that there is a constant shifting and moving of who, what leadership looks like and who is mentored into leadership and what, um, what accountability looks like that is agreed upon within the, the spaces uh, where, where all stakeholders have value, not just those who have power establishing what value means and those who are sort of, because systems are sort of naturally hierarchical. So people who are laboring, people who are learning, people who are in the sort of the, the um, under leadership, right? Are always subjected to what the leaders say. Is I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm arguing for socialism, but I think that I'm arguing for a rethinking, a radical rethinking of what power looks like in the spaces that we navigate. For example, a school, right? So SVA, you know, uh, what does it look like for those who have power at SVA to mentor people into positions of power who are in, who are uh, different in terms of their identity and, and presentation than they are? Um, that if you have a system where people are mentored into leadership, for example then you have representation that is fluid and, and active and, and constantly changing, right? So there is never just one guard. And I think that is the case in government. And I think that should be the case in corporate, in corporate life. And I think that should be the case in technology where there is an intention to mentor people and to accept, to name the ways in which people are different, to say who is not in the room and then to set an intention to actually activate getting those people into the room, right? So that could be disabled people, that could be, uh, um, people with, with neuro, neuro differences. That could be people based on race, gender presentation, sexual orientation, all of the ways in which we see uh, right, that the hegemony has excluded people from spaces of power because 
Historically, this is what Kimberly Crenshaw in her talk of intersectionality has said, that what has happened is that because the kinds of people who have had power historically pass it down to people who are most like them, that there is just a natural marginalization of anyone who doesn't fit the mold of what power has looked like. Um, and so those people tend to be, uh, there are always reasons for why those people don't attain power, right? Don't gain equity. And power, maybe I'm overusing the term power, but don't gain equity, right? Because equity tends to look like um, a sort of flattening of the bottom rather than a, a pulling up um, and, and building spaces of, of, of difference at, the, at sort of the top levels of, of where people have leadership. Thank you. Yeah, the question of museums there, I think is really important because one of the questions museums are being forced to ask right now is, A, who do they represent? But also how are the assumptions around how some of those museums came into being, how they acquired works in their collections, how they have historically represented work in their collections, the kind of language that's used to describe work, hence the word primitive to describe right, work in the ancient Americas section, right, the idea that some work is primitive, and also then that word, that the work it represents people who are seen as primitive, right, the very language, the very representation of work in museums is a problem that needs to be addressed, not just by changing exhibitions, but by asking fundamental questions about who, what those institutions are, and, and, where, and, and where they have come from, right? Um, and I have this whole very unpopular <laughs> idea that I have had very nice arguments with curators about um, that I am actually in favor of replicas um, with the belief that a replica can say the thing that needs to be said about a work as, as an artifact, as a, as a storytelling device, as an historical object. Um, and that, that the, the, the originalness of the object should not be essential to its, to, to how people access information that is available through the object. Maybe that's a long kind of weird way of saying that, but uh, I think the idea that we should own the things, that the thingness of the thing is the thing that has value. Um, and therefore we have things that should, we should not have in museums because they did not, they were not given to those museums. They were taken by those museums. They were claimed. And in claiming them, they were erasing and marginalizing entire communities. They were stealing from communities. And so I think there's a very real question there about what is the responsibility? What is the ethical responsibility? And I think this goes back in a, in a weird way to the question of language is what is our responsibility um, to own things and then to give them up when owning them is an act of inequity, when owning them is an act of cultural violence? Um, I think some of that was done in France when they shipped some of the, the artifacts back to the original um, owners. But yeah. that was a part of the question I was, I was trying to ask is that all of this seems quite ideal, you know, yeah. like a kind of idealist um, vision of the future, but who really um, would be willing to give up their seat of power and, and that's just a logical, you know, thought. Who will give up their seat of power when this power can be passed down to their children, children, children's children? And would you relinquish that power in order to let someone that has been subservient to you um, ascend, knowing, especially in the Western canon, the fear of, um, revenge or or that same yeah. kind of oppression um befalling you and not even you but your 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 predecessors so to speak yeah 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 uh, yeah i agree with you i don't know you know i mean maybe it's one of the reasons i'm not an activist 
because I think that there is a part of me that um, I believe in the fight. I, do, I, I, I very much believe in the fight. And I actually think that. <sighs> you sound like a lot there. Then I was watching an interview with the last poets, that's the name of it. That he yeah. mentioned something like, I like the fight. The fight is important to me. So it just reminded me of that. Yeah. Right. And I think it's the fight. And so for, for me, I think there is, and I think for many people who are doing work in futuring, so developing these visions of the future that allow us to see paths forward, that allow us to see what change can look like. You know, I think one of the things that art and design have the capacity to do beyond words is to show what is possible to envision, to manifesto, to manifest through art and design, what a possible future can be. And so I think that you, you know, administrators and bureaucrats, that's not the business that they're in. But I think that when art and design speaks to what change can be, they create that collective consciousness, right? The collective consciousness that then starts to embrace what is possible and that establishes new norms and conditions wherein people get to actually move toward the possible, but that we can't do that until we can actually see it and name it uh, and, and, and see it honestly. Um, you know, for 400 years, everybody said, how are we gonna end slavery? I mean, I'm not trying to be flippant, but look, you know, the, at some point you have enough of a vision of how we get out of the violence of this, of what we have created, um, that we, we do make change. Um, just despite all of the reasons not to. <laughs> Despite all of the reasons that we will that we want to hold on to the the comfort of the of the conditions that we are being oppressed in, oh, that was a terrible answer. But I mean that 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 I think that visualizing that idealizing, I think that idealizing is necessary. Otherwise, what do we we give up and we just say, okay, nothing's going to change. We're just going to do. We're just going to keep doing this. That doesn't seem. Mm -hmm. and, and I were talking earlier about this sort of about how this election sort of um, represented that you know how Trump was sort of like a trigger to bring up issues into the actual surface um, and um, I feel like this is the beginning of an actual change I'm, I'm, I am optimistic um, yeah so I, I, maybe not so much about giving back what because it's it's kind of impossible to actually trace back who was what, uh, but maybe just like including into a conversation or just like actually um, reaching out to people who are more marginalized, like you mentioned, expanding education. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think cautious optimism and radical idealism, I think they can live together. If, oh, can you easily see? Oh, I'm just looking at the question in here, asking how we could equally see a hundred representations. I mean, I think that that question really still goes back to. Um, the issue of equity scarcity and the notion that everyone has to rise immediately in the same way that equity, equity is a set of mechanisms and conditions, but not necessarily positions. Did that, does that kind of give us something to think about? Um, that equity is the mechanism by which justice and uh, an agency are possible, but it doesn't determine the outcome. So not everyone gets to be on top because then there would be no top, but everyone gets to have, but equity says that we have created a system within which each person has the capacity to rise in whatever way they choose. 
I mean, that's right, St. Augustine, to each what one chooses, right, to each what is right for each, which is to say that equity means that each person has the agency to achieve what one chooses without um, some external forces determining you can't get any higher because your identity, your presentation, your version of self is not acceptable within this space, right? So equity accepts difference, but it doesn't say that all people are represented equally all the time, but it allows for the capacity for, uh, for representation to be more just, to be more possible to be more present. Again, I have like all of these like answers that are sort of not answers. I don't know. They're not answers, but just responses. I had a question. Um, I was wondering if, if all of, um, if all humans on the earth were, you know, everything, they all received equity all the wrongs were fixed and you know everything was put on a path to you know doing everything correct if um eventually either way um things would go back to being like messed up and i and i'm saying this because i watched this experiment with mouses where they put them in this box i'll put the i'll put the experiment in the chat but they put the mouses in, in this perfect conditions everything was perfect but at the end of the day they just all destroyed each other so I don't oh, know yeah. if it's like humans like no matter what like I mean I'm trying yeah. to be optimistic but yeah but I think I think it's it's possible like if you know because humans like we're smart we're getting smarter we're learning from our mistakes so eventually it may be possible that we all just figure out this this constant flow and balance oh yeah or, you know <laughs> I, I don't I think, think that's gonna happen yeah I mean yeah. look we're still humans <laughs> Mm. <laughs> or never i don't know what this ideal like the idealized world i'm not there right i don't i don't think that we're gonna make some like utopia that is a literally the no place you know it just doesn't exist but i but i think that the again the the work the process of moving toward equity i think requires um a thoughtfulness around look things are just not working in this moment for for a lot of people for reasons that are arbitrary that have to do with historical injustices and historical narratives around the values that some people bring that other people are just absent from or excluded from right the historical erasures of entire communities so that is a very real like actual tangible set of inequities that are in our laws, that are in our systems, that are in our economic policies, right? These are things that are not about world peace. That is a, that's a fantasy, right? But are about um, actual systems that are, that are, look, economic um, injustices, because com some communities, Black communities, poor communities, uh, immigrant communities are situated near sites of industry that are polluting their water, their air, their land, right? That is an historic injustice. It has to do with the way housing policies have been enacted, economic policies have been enacted, labor practices have been enacted. These are real things. And so people are people, we are nuts. I mean, I, and it, I mean that in a good way, like we're all, we, we can't all be peaceful and, and uh, all, you know, this, that's right. That's not what we're talking about, but equity within our system. So we say that people are not excluded from getting a fair education. People are not excluded in living where they choose. People will not be thrown out of their homes because gentrification has made it um, impossible for people to live in the communities where they were raised, right? That people should have opportunities to move about the earth without having to be stopped at borders and harassed and, and violated for trying to cross a border. Right, that these are that people who are born in this country, who are born outside of this country and come here as babies, shouldn't be subjected to policies that discriminate and disadvantage them for their entire lives. Right, these are real things. So I, I think that the inequities that we can look at within the space of small communities at scale, right? If we can look at what does it look like in our smaller communities, the places where we actually have power, where we are stakeholders. And I always come back to like in our in our academic programs, if we can talk about equity in these spaces where it's actually relatively safe, then we can go further out and say, okay, then what does equity look like out here when I'm in the workplace? 
okay, so then what does it look like out here in my township or in my city, in my neighborhood? And then what does it look like further? And so I think the scale is you talk about equity, you unpack the language, the truth of how people are holding power in the spaces that we are working within to start that process. Globally, I don't, I'm not worried about globally, but I am worried about where we are right here, you know? Yes, there's definitely a lot of work to be done in the uh, United States for sure. in all, yeah. every aspect. Yeah. yeah, you're definitely a socialist. <laughs> I, <just laughs> <can't>. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, I don't think it's, is that a good or a bad thing? Maybe it's, it's not, not a bad thing. Um, <laughs> thinking about the group first, I guess that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, yeah, so I guess it's a compliment. But <laughs> I tend to think about, you said something quite telling to me that the people that come to the table are normally the people that, that are marginalized or facing some sort of oppression. And I am of the opinion that I don't necessarily need to go, in, go to any table because why beg? or ask for why what not? should be, or, you know, why not create a space on your own, you know? Because to me, that's been done, especially people that experience are at the, the middle passage. We have been in this type of position yeah. where we've been asking for the right to be. Yeah. And I find that quite telling that since the second reconstruction, not much have really changed. Um, because especially in light of what took place the other day, and this yeah. was such a global phenomenon, in yeah. our spectacle, um, where this movement reached across the world, where footballers, our soccer players, knelt in solidarity. Um, to, 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 uh, to the movement, why, is, why, why are you still at the table, yeah. you know, why not shape your own destiny, take it up right. in your own hands and do what you may, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. this is just a question to you. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a valid question. I, I will say that, um, so, I actually do believe very strongly in communities that are that are functioning outside of any need to to uh, <laughs> to go to the table or invite people to the table who have been historical oppressors. And I actually think that the idea of building community um, that is entirely for for the for the community, I, I think that actually those spaces have probably um, will, th will thrive in ways that people who are trying to mediate conflict can't even imagine, right? I just think that there's something that's happening in these, in these community spaces that is extremely powerful. So I, I'm with you. And at the same time, I think that there is a, a value in building equity in spaces where people are looking to grow and thrive and gain Right and and um, and and be inside of the spaces that are already existent. And I think I want to make, I want to encourage and help be a part of what that kind of change looks like. So I think it's a it's a yes and for me, which is that yes, I think that in the space of exclusive community, those things are taking place, and there's tremendous power there. But equity still needs to happen um, in spaces where it just doesn't exist yet. I think we got another question in the yeah. chat. I'll read it for you. Okay. It says, thank you so much for your talk. Why do you think we try to fix problems that are created by this system? Quote, parentheses, sorry, capitalism state, close parentheses, within this system. And why do we try to create a different, why don't we try to create a different system? You think that's too far-fetched? I think 
it's impossible to create just societies under the existing system and institutions. Yeah, I mean, I think you might be right. Yeah, look, I'm not, an, again, like, um, this thing about being the educator is I can see all the sides. <laughs> and I think that they're all valid because I, you know, very affirming. So yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think it's far-fetched. I think, you know what? Democracy was built out of a, out of a revolution, right? Revolutions make change. So what does the next thing look like? Maybe capitalism is a failed system. Maybe democracy is a failed system. Maybe constitutional democracies are failed systems. Maybe we need something new. But I still think, as this is not you know, a room of politicians, but artists, is that the capacity that art has is to imagine that new possibility or to reflect it or to represent what other, what you are seeing um, of the challenges of this moment or just reflecting on your own selves <laughs> under the conditions in which you are working and living and thinking and moving. And that, that the art of this time will be looked on 20, 40, and 50, and 100 years from now as reflections of the tensions and anxieties that we're all feeling, or the joy that we're feeling, right? Or the questions that we are expressing. So I think that the work that you're creating, to me, the, the idea of the, the, the work that you're creating is, is not to be necessarily, necessarily the bureaucrat who's in there making this kind of change toward equity, but to represent what it is and can be and how and your interpretation of, of this this world we're living in. And also I think again, just not to again, not to be flippant, but in the space of of the academy, right? Of the academic work of making, of being right, a, a thinker around fine art is to ask what equity looks like in the spaces where you are where you are working currently and where you're hoping to work. So what does equity look like in your practice? I think we we talked about this in a colloquium. Um, Mark asked all of us like what is a dream or a goal that was outside of our personal and it was more like as like everybody's winning and yeah, I think uh, what I was thinking was I would try to, if I could help with equity, I would try to um, help out with helping people from lower class schools, so in inner cities, to have access to like Parsons, SVA elite institutions by, I don't know, somehow sponsoring them or, you know, just, I, I would like to see that because I think there's a lot of creativity and things that we haven't seen, but some of these people don't get a chance to come to learn in these, you know, these type of places, but yeah. Yeah, because these institutions are inaccessible because they're not for all kinds, for economic reasons, but also for reasons of culture, reasons of, of representation. And I think that one of the questions Alex, that, that, you know, I wonder follows that question of how do we bring people into these institutions is how do these institutions need to radically change in order to be accessible to local communities? And what is, what is actually SVA's responsibility to local communities? Because art and design exists in all places. It is not an elite discipline. People, Bill Trailer, People make art everywhere, regardless of their economic position. And so what responsibility does SVA have to make the tools of art making available to all people, regardless of their ability to pay? That's not a simple question. I don't have the economic answer to that, but I think that it's a question SVA and Parsons and NYU and all of the schools should continue to um, work toward solving and I think Parsons actually has, you know, the Parsons Scholars Program is specifically about creating a, a studio space and mentorship opportunities for high school students in, in local public schools. 
an SBA could use that. I was working at an after school program in a high school and I think one of our students uh, was part of that program. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, apparently, because at first I thought, is that a marketing tool for Parsons? And they say, it's, I, they claim it's absolutely not and that it, it really is just about providing you know, this, the space and the resources for high school students. Um, and also to think about how arts and design schools are creating a, a space for people to really come whole, to be the kind of artists they choose to be, to not be trained to be the kind of artists that faculty have determined they should be, which I'm not saying happens in the fine arts space, but I would argue that often in the design programs, there is a sense of, and, and this, is a, this is just a critique that I have just, you know, very open about, that I'm very concerned that a lot of the design disciplines are asking students to become the kind of designers that they're learning from, as opposed to learning, having a pedagogy that teaches people to be the kind of designers that are radically rethinking what design can be. And I think that possibility is something that has to really be embedded in the curriculum, that we're not training people to become us, that we are actually encouraging them to be active interrogators and critical thinkers around what they're learning and, and what practice can look like. Mark Tribe says they are for fully funded free universities for everyone. Yeah. Second that. Yeah. Yes. Maybe one final question is, how, what can we do to create more equity for ourselves and the people around us? What's like a, what's something that we could incorporate into our lives and practice? You know, I think that the, all departments need to have space for students to have small and large group conversations that, in, that are both with the students and the faculty and administrators to, again, unpack what equity means how people are coming into the space, what power looks like, what the dynamics of power are, and, and what it means to, and, and to start there. And I think that if we can have those conversations um, and then create blueprints for change that are actionable, that's, that is a step. Um, and it just requires, um, you know, time, time and space, and I think a structure within which people can have those conversations with safety and without the fear of recrimination, right? And I would really like to see SBA develop more opportunities for, for students and faculty to be mentored into leadership. And so to figure out what leadership or leaderful spaces can look like uh, for the institution and then how that carries out into professional practice for artists and designers and illustrators, et cetera. And pedagogy, you gotta, you gotta always interrogate the pedagogy. Oh my God, it's 11 o'clock. Yes. I'm sure people are tired. Yeah, we are, we are almost out of time. Um, you know, I was, I private messaged a whole bunch of people who weren't participating. And um, of course they wrote about, wrote back to me privately. So I'm gonna share what they said anonymously. I asked each of them to share their thoughts to the group and none of them had, none of them was willing to do that. So oh. I'm, I'm gonna share them. Uh, it, it, uh, so let's see, someone said, I feel like the word equity has different meanings under different contexts. I'm still not sure how I should talk about all this appropriately. Someone else said, um, this is one way it's, uh, no, someone else said, um, let's see. I kind of agree with Nefeli's idea. It does make me headache every time I think about similar questions. For now, I think, where there's people there will have system and class. This is not a problem that the revolution can solve. Somebody else said, I just thought that the questions are too grand and theoretical and we as artists aren't that powerful as we thought. And someone else said, if one day our descendants will have a chance to solve this problem and find a better way to replace the state and government then human beings must first reach the higher civilization of the universe. 
Awesome. Um, and someone else said, yeah, it's a lot to think about, but from my experience, one's power cannot change a system. Even we can change our own system, it's not easy to change people's prejudice, especially as an outsider. Mm. And someone else said, I would say, here's an example that most of Chinese people are numb and study to accept about various red slogan on street, which are action of wash brain from the government. If you ask about how, how all this sounds about equity and community stuff to citizens of the PRC, that's my pessimistic opinion. And um, yeah. So I was, I was just really curious because, you know, like I feel like to some extent there, there are a bunch of people here in this conversation who, for whom this, this conversation is really accessible, right? Right. And, and it feels like, oh yeah, this is, you know, I need, I'm, I need to speak up because this is like, this is my conversation, right? This is, yeah. this, these are issues that are relevant to me and that I'm working through right now. And I just had this feeling that there's a bunch of other people here for whom it's like we're on another planet or something yeah. like that, talking to each other. And I'm, 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 the real challenge for me is like, how can we, how can we, I mean, this is an intercultural space, right? Yeah. That we're in right now. But the conversation we're having is kind of monocultural, or at least two or three. It's like people from North America, Latin and South America, and the Caribbean yeah. are really participating. And then we get a few outside voices from people who are maybe more assimilated or you know uh, have had more spent more time here. And I just I'm I'm concerned about that about how yeah. to have conversations that feel so important and vital for 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 some of us and for others are to seem, I'm, 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 I'm intuiting or maybe, you know, not, maybe not so, uh, yeah. we yeah. haven't found a way to frame them or think about them in a way that can, can pull it, pull in everyone here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that th this is, um, I, and I haven't figured out the right way to do it in groups that are these kinds of mixed intercultural international groups i think there's a real challenge and scale seems to me to be at the core of that challenge that there is a way in which we need to make space for people who are already having this conversation to have it organically without having to have all of the explanatory commas to explain all of the terms to explain all of the conditions to work through all of the history um, I think that there's also a need to bring people into the conversation because to study and work in the United States is to become responsible for the shared history, for the shared collective action. It's not to say that the, um, to experience it in the same way, but to understand the conditions. Um, you know, I think that I, I deal with this more with the design space is that designers who are coming from other countries who want to work in the United States cannot ignore the history of racism, right, cannot ignore the history and the, the implicit biases within the systems in which they'll be working, that those are necessary to understand because unfortunately it's like gentrification, you know, you come into a space, you are concerned with what your place is there, but you have to understand the people who are maybe being displaced and disenfranchised in part because you are now there. And we are all doing this, right? We're all moving into places, um, or often are moving into places where our very presence is changing the dynamics of place. And so there is a there is a need to be aware of those dynamics to not unintentionally disenfranchise people because you're not asking the question. So I, I think that the again this like you know in a room of fifty people half of whom might be coming from other parts of the world where they don't even know that indigenous communities still exist here. They've never heard about black, uh, you know, African-American racism. They don't know about the issues with, uh, you know, dreamers and immigration and at the issues of the border, right? They don't know the history of anti-Semitism in the United States. There are a whole host of things that you cannot, just say, well, that's not my issue and therefore I don't need to learn about it. It is, 
well, those are things I haven't learned, but they are essential to my understanding of how I make a place here. Mm. Right. And I would say just to, to even as an example, last year before COVID and we, the shutdown, um, when the Fashion Institute of Technology had in their thesis work, a, uh, as I understand it, a Chinese fashion student who employed what turned out to be a racist imagery in their work, uh, sort of a blackface imagery in their work. Um, and the school, nobody at the school stopped and said, you can't show that and here's why. Let's talk about the history of blackface. Let's talk about the history of race, right? In the context it, it, at all. And so you would need to have mechanisms in place for people to be able to talk honestly about what they see and how they're creating representations of people and what these histories are and, and, and how we are, uh, uh, um, uh, how we are positioning ourselves in relation to other people's experiences of oppression, of power, of bias, etc. So I don't know, maybe, you know, we need, we need to talk about what that forum is to have better conversations. Yeah. And I think we need to broaden the conversation too, um, so that it's not only relevant to the extent that people want to, to, to work or show work in the United States or Europe or the Americas, yeah. um, but also for people you know, who are seeking an education here and, continue, and intend to, to work professionally and continue their practices outside this sphere where the issues are very different. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're from Taiwan, for example, and, yeah. you know, you're coming to the, you're studying the U.S., maybe you're not even actually physically here. <laughs> and yeah. then, you, you know, you're not planning to, to, to you know, to, to, to make art and show art in America. You know, there, you know, maybe it's equally our responsibility to try, try to figure out a way to, to have this conversation in a way that's really relevant more, more broadly. Um, right. And you know, what are the issues? And I don't know even how to talk about these things when you live in a place with such a powerful state um, right. or, you know, where there's much less recognition. I mean, like, for example, there are indigenous people in Taiwan, but very few people, you know, a lot of Taiwanese are not aware of that. There's a tremendous ethnic diversity in China um, and a lot of, you know, ethnic marginalization. There's tremendous amounts of, uh, you know, oppression and discrimination when it comes to sexuality um, and gender. So I don't know. Um, but I think this is, for, I mean, I, I should let you have the last word, but, um, but I'm, I'm pretty encouraged by this. I don't know. This isn't so much a start, but, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this conversation, you know, continues and that, students hold hold us hold me and hold us hold this department accountable um on an ongoing basis um to the extent that you want to but that would be really welcome yeah yeah and i see that stephanie just wrote power structures are cross-cultural i agree uh, and i think they're also very particular and i think that you're right that this you know i feel very honored that you asked me to come and talk. I feel like a lot of what I'm thinking about is emergent. And so I don't have answers. I just have a desire to engage the, the people who are, um, who are capable of making change, not because you're bureaucrats and activists and politicians, but because you're artists <laughs> and designers. I actually think that that is a site of how we make meaning in the world. And so I just feel encouraged that anybody is interested in, in, in being a part of a conversation where we're asking questions and saying that we wanna hold people accountable. And whether it's creating our own communities or working within power structures to dismantle them, creating something new, imagining speculatively what might be. I think all of those and more, uh, and, and, and also knowing that this way of having the conversation is really incomplete and doesn't capture um, the, the capacity of each of us to untangle our own experiences 
power and privilege and the, the specific ways in which, uh, you know, we're showing up. So I'm, you know, I just thank you for listening to me chat for the last couple of hours. So thank you.